the cost benefit analysis for thinking about decisions is a lot better than you think it is. It is much easier to work with someone like us and define what decision making you want and then automate it than you think it is. And the value of this is much higher than you think it is. Um, there's a tendency for people to be resistant to think, oh, I've got all these rules and it's so hard and it took me so long last time I tried to do a rules project. And we're like, the world has changed. Yeah, the way you think about the problem, the way you model the problem, the way you implement the problem, we can get this stuff done much faster and much cheaper than you think we can. And the value you'll get out of it is much higher than you think, right? And so, you know, people have, you know, re have, have resisted automating decision-making and it's a pity. So mm -hmm. stop. Hello and welcome to season two of Bots and Thoughts, the hyper automation podcast sponsored by Salient Process. I'm your host, Jimmy Hewitt, AKA Mr. Automation. Hello, Bots and Thoughts community. I am super excited to bring you another major voice in the hyper automation space, the CEO of Decision Management Solutions, James Taylor is one of the leading minds in the business rules management space today. If keywords like policy, rules, and decisions come up in your daily work as an OPEX leader, then this episode is very much so for you. Rules, policies, and decisions are everywhere. How and why do you review, approve, or reject a claim or an application? Uh, what if software could automate this for you in a fully traceable, auditable, and natural language fashion? Are business rules treated as first-class objects in your organization, and why should they be? To answer that question and many, many more, I'm thrilled to bring you the CEO of Decision Management Solutions, my friend, James Taylor. Thanks so much, James, for joining us on the podcast, Bots and Thoughts. Sure, you're How welcome. How are you this morning? Uh, I'm good. I'm good. I, I, I have my, uh, my favorite coffee mug, which says, but first coffee. So, you know. Nice. Uh, How do we, you take uh, your coffee? Uh, black and regularly. Um, black yeah. and regularly. Nice. We have, a, we have a phrase we use internally. We always talk about doing our projects decisions first. And, and uh, one of my colleagues said, well, but mm -hmm. after coffee, obviously. I mean, yeah, <laughs> decisions are important, yeah. but after coffee, right? Yeah, it's like, <laughs> That's fabulous. And a perfect segue into our conversation on decision uh, management, business rule management, digital decisioning, not mm -hmm. to use a word cloud there, but let's dive right in for our audience. James would love if you could give a bit of background on yourself, who you are, what you do and how you got here. Sure. So, I mean, let's start with what we do, right? So, so our focus is on helping companies who have high volume transactions or interactions where it's not immediately obvious what they should do automate that decision in an effective and manageable way, right? That's fundamentally what we do. How do you take a situation where you've got to decide something because it's not obvious what to do, but there's a high volume or a relatively short time window to do it in, or it's expensive or there's high risk, or there's some reason you want to have control over this. And we help people automate that. And I got into this huh, 20 plus years ago. So I was working in business roles. I, I had I'd recommended business roles to three different engineering teams at three different software companies. And every time the engineers had said, nah, we'll just write code, right? So I got fed up with this. So I went to work mm -hmm. for a business rules management system company. Uh, and we then got acquired by an analytics company and we got rolled up. And it became apparent in this context that the, you know, we were building systems for banks that combined business rules and predictive analytics and machine learning and, and optimization and you know, uh, A-B testing, champion challenger and all these things into a single application. And these were enormously valuable applications. So we were like, this must be a thing, right? You know, we, we're not making this stuff up, right? Which is, this is, these are real applications. So we came up with this phrase, decision management, to talk about this stack. A stack of technologies designed to help you identify, automate, manage, and improve these high volume transactional decisions. So when we started, yeah, you know, they were expensive to build, to be honest. Uh, and so you could only really afford to build them for like credit card fraud and uh, credit card origination, where there's a lot of money at stake and higher volumes, but the price has dramatically dropped. The technology's got better. Everyone's data's got better. The cloud, all these things. So now the price point is such that you can use them for uh, much lower volume transactions and much less valuable ones. And so now it's become, yeah, you know, really, uh, you know, 
everyone's got opportunities for this. It's just a question of finding them. I want to get into use cases. I want to yeah. get into those high value applications you're talking about. I want to get into the predictive decisioning, AI, mm -hmm. ML. Um, those are, ed, let's call them intermediate to advanced topics. For our audience, <laughs> let's, let's start with some broad brushstrokes of the terrain. If you could describe either with word clouds or, you know, kind of a, a level 100, level 101 mm -hmm. overview of the, 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 the landscape that is decision management business sure. rules, sure. um, would love if you could paint a backdrop for us. Yeah, so, so generally the, the, the core platform in all these technologies is really a business rules management system, increasingly called a decisioning platform to try and like make it a bit clearer, up level the conversation a little bit. The analogy would be, we call it a process management platform, we don't call it a task management platform. So we should call it a decision management platform, not a rule management platform, because the decision is the, is the business artifact that matters. So these platforms basically allow you to break down a very complex problem uh, how do I originate this loan? Can I pay this claim? Uh, what offer does Jimmy get next to make him a more valuable customer? And these things can be very complicated and mm -hmm. break them down so that I can express them very, very simply using uh, business rules. And business rules are really just declarative logic. Just if this is true and this is true and this is true, then do this. Right? And you assemble these in a, in a structured way so that you can make these relatively complex decisions. And what matters in here is not executing them. Everyone talks about business rules, engines, and execution, and it's never important because this is logic. Computers turn out to be really good at executing logic. It's kind of their thing, right? So getting the rules to execute is not the problem. Right? You can mm -hmm. do that in a process platform. You can do it in a low-code platform. You can write Python code, and it executes just fine. The you problem is managing it. code it yourself. You yeah, exactly. You've got to be able to manage it, right? And so managing the question is, can it. you find the rules you need to change? Can you change them safely? Do you know what impact it will have when you make the change? And having done all of that, is it then cheap and easy to update the system with the new rules? And so that's what a BRMS does, is it really provides you with that management framework to do all those things. So something like our IBM's ODM, which is sort of the flagship product, has tremendous tools for simulating the impact of a change, comparing two different things and telling what all the differences are, making it easy to version things and manage that and give different people access to different rules, all the stuff you'd expect to make management easy. That's what you're paying for. That's great. What a lovely backdrop from <laughs> the man himself, James. I would imagine that people out there listening to this have those business rules currently being executed today already, whether they know it or not, mm -hmm. but they struggle with the, the part that you mentioned, which is managing it. Uh, how do current states typically look like as right. you and your team come in? Are they hard coded into a homegrown, you know, loan underwriting system, which again, to your point, ch big checkbox on the execution part, it works, right? but the, the challenge is improving the sophistication of those homegrown rules. Where do they live? How do I change them? What's the impact of change? What does the current state kind of look like? Sure. I actually, I've started to, when people tell me, but it works currently, and I'm like, if you can't rapidly find it and change it, then it doesn't work. It merely Nicely executes. Said. It just it executes. It merely executes. Sure, it executes. It doesn't work. Because if it worked, you could change it. Um, anyway, um, what do we find? I would say uh, a significant number are just hard-coded. Python code, yeah. Java code, you know, just code, right? Um, a, a relatively surprising percentage are still done manually. It's still, we've got policy documents and guidelines and rules and scripts for people wow. and shit like that. And hard coded is kind of the uh, next yeah, level hard, off of manual. Yeah, exactly. If they could just wow. code it, that would be progress, right? Um, <laughs> and then uh, a non trivial number have it um, smeared through their process, right? So they have hmm. lots of little snippets of logic, whether in a rules management system or in their process engine or in code. Um, spread through lots of steps in their process. So what they've done is they've taken the business decision, they've broken it up into 35 little pieces, and they've made each one a step in the process um, because they think they have to manage it using their process tools. Um, mm. This is not as common as it used to be. <laughs> it used to be more common. But with the advent of um, decision modeling, 
to go alongside process modeling. Most people who are thinking about a process at least know there's a thing called decision modeling. Mm -hmm. and, and so it seems to have reduced the level of people who are like doing this. But a lot of legacy systems are still like this. We see like claims handling where they're like, well, we've got, yeah, we call the business rules 27 times in the claims process. And I'm like, well, why? You, you know, your claims process consists of three steps. Assemble the data for a claim. Decide if you're going to pay the claim. Pay the claim. Yeah, I mean, more steps than that, and, and something's wrong, right? And they're like, well, but the decide is like, does it pass this test? Does it pass this test? Does it pass this test? And so they have these gates, one after another in the process. And it just makes the process enormously complicated and very hard to change, right? Because they've entangled the process in decision-making. So we see that, so, you know, sometimes. Yeah, that sounds like decisions and business rules being treated as a second class citizen right. in the enterprise, that, that yep. scenario you described. And what your company specializes in is elevating business rules into first class objects right. within the organization. Absolutely. So decisions at least, right? Decisions as first class objects. So talk about that. What does it look like for decision for a company who does treat decisions as a first class object? Sure. So when, when you treat decisions as a first class object, you get a couple of advantages. Generally, if you look at your process side of things, you get processes that are simpler, um, smarter and more agile. So they're simpler because they have fewer steps, quite literally, um, because you encapsulate more of the decision-making in a single decision-making step. So you up-level the conversation instead of saying, what are the rules that tell me your policies in force? What are the rules that tell me your policy covers this claim? What are the Instead of each of those being a step, I say, should we pay this claim? And I call the decision engine once and I get one result back and, and I have a much simpler process interface. Right? Yes. And whether I'm using RPA or, or BPM or orchestrate, or it doesn't matter what it is, I, I dramatically reduce the number of interaction points I have. The second thing we find is um, that it's a lot easier to apply machine learning when you do that because mm. machine learning and predictive analytics is, is fundamentally about data-driven decision-making. And so if you don't know where the decisions are in your process, then it's very hard to improve them with analytics. And it's so table stakes you know, for AI now. Yeah, exactly, right? to some extent. Right now, that's... We often talk about interface AI. There's a whole bunch of AI around turning documents into data and stuff like that that works yeah, really yeah. well. And that's got nothing to do with decision making. Right? That's about like your process, right? But when you get into the predictive machine learning kind of stuff, you really need a decision context. It's hard to do it otherwise. And then the third thing we find is it makes for a dramatic increase in agility because you've now got them loosely coupled. And so, oh, someone says, we've got to add a mobile app. Well, great. I add a mobile app. It changes my process but it doesn't change my decision-making at all because nothing's changed, right? Similarly, uh, a new regulation comes in that says, oh, you've got to approve a certain kind of like COVID test claim that you didn't have to approve 10 minutes ago. Well, now I can just change my decisioning and I haven't changed my process at all, mm -hmm. right? So I get uh, a dramatic uptick in agility. We, we find that the number of nice. processes that constantly change is actually quite small. They're not zero, but most of the time when people say they have a highly variable process what they mean is within the process there's a decision that i have to keep changing not always but most of the time that's the problem as so if you separate the decision making out you often find you can dramatically stabilize the process um yeah because changing processes is, is is typically organizationally more difficult because there are carbon-based life forms right so the people are involved and so if you want to change the process steps and the process sequence and the ui you've got to retrain people and tell them about it and, and so that acts as a natural constraint on your ability to change the process, right? You, you've got to think about the people who are using right. the process. And if you have an automated decision, then to some extent you can change that more readily because, you know, as long as it doesn't pick a new possible outcome, it just changes how it picks between them, the process doesn't need to change. So simpler, smarter, more agile, those are, those are the big things. Um, we also find for a lot of our customers who have legacy platforms, a lot of them bought legacy processing platforms for loan origination or for claims, underwriting or something. And these platforms uh, are really systems of record, right? They're just about keeping the policy documents or the claim documents to, as a set, mm. moving them through the process. But they tend to have a certain amount of, of, of uh, poorly managed decision-making in them. And so they're very hard to upgrade because you've got all this logic sure. embedded in them, right? 
And so what we find is when you extract that into a decision engine, often your ability to then replace the legacy platform with a new one, like a process engine from IBM or something, right, goes up dramatically, right? Suddenly you go, oh, well, now my process looks much more manageable because I've separated out the decision making. So now my legacy facets implementation of my claims or whatever it is doesn't look quite as gnarly. So now I think I probably could move that to a process engine, you know, and get it cleaned up. And, and it can seem impossible to do when they're all like, you know, when everything's just like mushed in like this, it's just like, well, I got this oh, horrible sure. hairball. I, I, you know, I'm stuck. <laughs> all I can do is hope that I can, you know, hand an enormous amount of money over to Cognizant to upgrade them to the new version and that, and, and, but nothing terrible will go wrong, but it's not a great strategy. Mm -hmm. Not to get into your company's secret sauce, but how can you help companies that have their logic embedded in these, sure. these either homegrown or out of the box, call it a pick on a loan origination platforms. Uh, how can you, either harvest or extract that to right. start from scratch from more of an ideal dream state somewhere in between. Sure. Yeah, what does that so, look like? Yeah. So, so we're big believers in decision modeling, right? So we're, we were an early submitter of the decision model and notation standard. We've been using decision modeling literally on every project since like 2011. Um, and you know, we always build decision models. So it's, it's our thing, right? And because we find they're fast, they're accurate, they're engaging, um, you know, there, there's no sort of plan B, right? Um, so what we typically want to do is we want to build a decision model. And what we have found works really well is to um, talk to the business about how the decision is made today, very much focused on how do you decide today? Because you must be yes. deciding today, otherwise you'd be out of business, right? So how do you decide today? What does that look like? And then as they structure the, the, the high level model, often we can then essentially, um, you know, reverse engineer the logic that's in the system into that framework. We don't like to start only with the code because then you don't, because the code's not written the way the business think about the problem. I mean, it never is. That's part of the problem. And that's part of the problem, right? So, so often for us, they'll be like, we're just talking to one right now, originations product project. They've got a um, scorecard and some auto reject rules and so on embedded in their platform. And we're like, well, we could take those out and we'll certainly turn those into, into decision artifacts but they'll be low level ones. And then what we, once we've done that, we'll want to have a conversation to get the structure right. And then once we have the structure right, we'll fill in the details and we'll reuse the things that are the same and so on and gradually put out. So we typically aim for your current state, how you decide today and trying to get that automated. And what we do is that typically adds enormous value to people because they get it consistent. Sure. They get to understand what it is and it gets embodied in software. So they get a higher rate of you know, automation and what they're doing, less manual work. And then we start to have the conversation about, well, how would you like to improve it? You know, what, what would make this better? How would you make this decision more accurately? And that might involve buying third party data. It might involve taking a document that today they just have to have a human look at and saying, well, can we automate looking at that and making a decision about it? And if so, what level of accuracy? Uh, it might involve using machine learning or predictive analytics or AI. You know, but we're trying very much to like, automate first, right? Get the automation framework in place so that they, you know, they feel like, you know, this is my, you know, I'm the head of credit risk. I know how this origination decision works. I can see that picture. That's how we decide. And uh, I'm confident that that's what's executing in my platform. Great. That's step one. <laughs> you got to get to that step first. Otherwise mm -hmm. it's really hard to get people to do anything else. So um, that's the most, by far the most common, right? You know, uh, talk to them directly and build a top-down model if it's manual. And then if it's existing automation, then do a little bit of a top-down model and then merge in the stuff they've already got, right? Um, when we do that, I have to say, Jimmy, we find all sorts of inconsistencies. Oh, yeah. I can't imagine. Yeah, because they're like, yeah, we did one famous origination system where there was like one set of logic around like credit risk and what was an acceptable credit risk. And they had different credit risk acceptability if your FICO score was above a certain level. I'm like, well, why does that matter? And they're like, well, because that means you've got good credit. That means you've got good potential as a customer. So we're like, okay, so you're deciding someone has good potential and you're using the FICO score as a proxy. And they're like, oh, well, that's interesting because that means we could do it some other way. And I'm like, well, yes. Anyway, we keep going. And there's another place where they have to say, is the loan profitable enough? And they had a slightly different cutoff for a slightly different FICO score. And so I said, well, what does that mean? He says, well, it means you've got really good credit. I says, well, it can't mean that. 
because that other FICO score means you've got really good credit. So this must mean something else because it's a different FICO score. And they looked at me and they go, well, obviously it's meant to be the same, isn't it? It's, like, it's just not because we've got rules in these two different places and they're not the same. So one of the big attractions of, of thinking about it as a decision is a dramatic increase in reuse and consistency because decisions are much more reusable artifacts. Okay, so understand how they decide today, workshop around how it can be smarter, right. more reusable, more consistent, more elegant. And is there a step three before you implement these rules? Like oh, a I final mean, model? No, I don't really accept step three so much as what there is, is um, uh, when we put it into production, it always goes into production with a continuous improvement framework. So Love for that. instance, you know, we, we never do that as phase two, right? What we, we've met so many people who bought a BRMS or decisioning platform and IT build version one. And then they say, once we get it working, then we're going to come back and we're going to empower the business to change the rules and manage the rules and do all these things. And it never happens, right? And so for us, uh, we tend to build these more vertical slices. We'll take a subset of the functionality and we'll go all the way through. So we get it implemented. We have these workshops. We get the rules right. We test them. We build a simulation environment so you can tell what happens if you make a change. We build a dashboard mm -hmm. so you can see how decisions happened in production, what that looked like, so that the minute we turn it on, you're getting data about how decisions were made yesterday that you can use to improve how you make decisions tomorrow. And you know, that ability for the business users to look at data, make changes and so on. So we had a, we had a, a claim team in Hong Kong that we did a project for and, and we set them up with this and they would, they, every week, they would go look at the claims we paid this week, look at the ones we didn't auto pay or auto reject, the ones we manually reviewed, try and figure out what tweaks they could make to reduce the number they had to look at. Then they would run a year's worth of historical data, real historical data pulled live from their claim system through the ODM simulation engine present the results, the difference to their bosses, like on a Friday afternoon, say, look, we want to make this change. Here's how last year would have been different, why this is better. We've checked these things. We've run the tests. It's great. It's all approved. They get approval on Friday afternoons. Uh, and then on Sunday, IT would deploy it. And they did this every week. So they're updating the way they handle changes. They're improving <laughs> the way they handle claims every week. And for us, that's the, that's the end game. That's what we really want to do. Is we want to get people that to think about this as something game. they can just keep changing, keep improving, right? That is the end game. We're starting to dip our toes into artificial intelligence and machine learning, human right. in the loop. Yep. How does AI ML intersect with BRMS? Sure. Um, yeah. How does it intersect? Yeah. What does that so, look like? So there's a great phrase. I mean, so um, uh, some, some time ago I, I, with a colleague, I wrote an article on, on HBR and we talked about the difference between human in the loop and human on the loop. Hmm. Right. And so what a BRMS allows you to do is have a human on the loop because that, that weekly team, they're not in the loop for most of those transactions, right? They're not actually participating in most of those decisions, but they're on the loop, right? They're watching it and improving it. And so what you want to do is try and transition to this, right? Um, there's a guy at Forrest and Mike Galtieri has this great phrase. He talks about human governed AI. And when hmm. you do a human governed AI, a lot of people think you mean, oh, you mean don't let the AI do anything make it suggest something to a human. And a friend of mine calls that the human airbag approach, right? Um, mm. I, I want to have a human I can blame, right? And that's it, right? And I think that somehow I've covered myself. Oh, well, I gave the result to Jimmy and Jimmy decided to follow the result. So it's Jimmy's fault, not the AI's fault, right? Which is just arrant nonsense. I mean, it's utter garbage, right? And mm. so for us, it's like, no, that's not the solution. The solution is to uh, define how humans and machines are going to work together, right? And so uh, there's an increasing interest in augmentation. How do you have a decision that is not 100% automated, but uses AI uh, and humans in combination to sort of you know, increase the level of automation? And what we find is that that only works if you're very explicit about exactly what the human does and exactly what the machine does. And so when we're starting to look at AI and machine learning, there's generally two um, broad areas. Right? One is we've got a set of rules today in one of our sort of like sub decisions that really was written by looking at data. Yeah, you know, we, we did some data analysis and we came up with a set of thresholds. Who's a gold customer? Well, we analyzed who our best customers were and we looked at their lifetime value and we came up with these thresholds, right? 
But in theory, any rules you came up with by looking at data, you could replace with machine learning and AI models, right? Because there's data. You looked at the data anyway, you could go, and so you could start to think about how you might improve them. But the other place is where there's human judgment, right? And so, um, you know, you've got, for instance, we did a, a project where one of the things was a medical report. And one of the reasons they had to have a manual review was because they had to check that the medical report you had submitted said that one of the things wrong with you was the thing you were making a claim for. Right, that was Good it. Um, they just had to check that, right? <clears throat> because they, yeah, they wanted to make sure they didn't want to know what they didn't care what else the report said at this point. They just wanted to know it said that. So they asked the machine learning team, or we we got them to ask the machine learning team and say, well, look, could you give us the likelihood that this long text document contains a description of a condition that matches the one in your claim? The claim will be described in terms of an ICD-10 code, a standard code for broken foot or whatever it is, and we want to know. How likely is it that this doctor says that Jimmy has a broken foot? If that's what Jimmy's saying he's claiming for, right? Um, and we don't need it to be terribly accurate. We just need it to be a sniff test, right? Because we're just trying to move it into a fast track kind of thing, right? And it was an interesting uh, example because here's a human judgment today. Someone has to read the document to decide something. And we were able to get them through the vehicle of this decision to say, in the context of this decision, if you could predict it at this level of accuracy, which was not very high, um, we'd be willing to like let the machine do it. You know, for those transactions where the machine said, yeah, 75% chance that this document describes the same condition as you're claiming for, and all these other things were true for which there were rules, great. Move it through the process. Don't make somebody read it. Right? Um, and so those are, those are more complex machine learning and AI things because you've got something which today is done by a human. And you have no rules for it. You have no definition of how this is done, really. And you, you're going to try and sort of learn how it's done using machine learning and then come up with some thresholds that say. And what we find is when you do that in the context of a decision model, one of the advantages you get is that you constrain the problem. You're not trying to solve the problem in the general case, right? The machine learning team in this particular case thought what they wanted to do was build a model that would go through the whole medical report and list all the ICD-10 codes that were in the report and how likely it was that each one was in the report. Right? That was what mm. they were planning to do. Mm -mm. What they needed in the context of this decision was, I've got a particular ICD-10 code. Is the likelihood greater than 60% or something? I, I don't really care what it is, just that it's more than 60. And I don't care about all the other ones. That's a dramatically simpler machine learning yeah. problem, right? And so part of what we try and do here is really say, you're not trying to build machine learning models that win prizes or are research projects. You're, mm -hmm. you're trying to say in the context of this business decision that happens in the context of this business process, I could use this kind of machine learning to increase the rate of strength of processing, reduce the rate of fraud. Yeah, there's some business metric that I can use for it. And it's remarkably hard sometimes to get machine learning teams to do this. Um, I was actually just speaking at Machine Learning Week um, hmm. about this problem, right? And, and um, the failure rate in machine learning and AI, once you exclude natural language processing and image recognition, the sort of interface AI, is mm -hmm. still very, very poor. I mean, 80% hmm. don't work, don't get into production. And it's hmm. gone up slightly. It's now about 70% getting into production. You know? um, but even if you're replacing an existing model, so you have a model and you build a more accurate one, it's only about a 50-50 shot. So the failure rate wow. is really high because machine learning teams are still trying to solve an arbitrary machine learning problem. They're not I mean, it seeing like it as part too much. of a decision-making problem. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And if they just think about it in context and go talk to the business users about the context and build a decision model so they understood the context, then they would yeah, reduce it. One of the people there asked me to follow up afterwards because she said, we've literally had every failure mode you described. Yeah. All of them. Everything you said could go wrong. We've had at least go wrong at least once. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm like, yeah, well, it's uh, pretty typical. It's, it's, a, it's a high failure, right? We're spending a lot more money, uh, Jimmy, but we're not getting a lot of benefit. I think LLMs, generative AI, image recognition, voice recognition, some of those, those tech, that tech works, right? The kind of stuff where you take a document and you turn it into structured data so you can run it through a process, that stuff is, is getting really reliable. Yes. But this sort of use of machine learning in the context of improving business decisions 
it's still a much more um much more complicated unless you're thinking about it in the context of decisioning. <laughs> decisions exactly yes exactly yeah and so i mean we're we're mm. we're you know when people ask us well yeah, you know, we got all this investment in machine learning. What should we be doing? And we're like, well, have you bought a decisioning platform yet? And they're like, they're well, like, no, why? We've got we're all talking this about AI. And I know. Yeah, exactly. I'm like, well, yeah, you probably won't be able to operationalize it at scale if you don't have a decisioning platform. Um, Amazing. Because that's just how it goes. <laughs> you know, um, yeah, at the, an old friend of mine once said the thing about predictive analytics, machine learning, is it doesn't do anything, it just makes a prediction. So you have to decide what you're going to do. And if you don't decide what you're going to do, then, then you didn't add any value. Yeah. So, so for us, that's a, yeah, yeah. So it's self-evident when you think about decisions, but apparently not when you're thinking about machine learning and AI and stuff. And a lot of their business users give them terrible requests. The number of people you meet who say, my business exec gave me a bunch of data and said, tell me something interesting about this. Yeah. And I'm like, that is the absolute worst requirements anyone has ever been given <laughs> where's the context where's, yeah, where's the, the context what where's does the better goal? mean what what would yeah. interesting be what would you do if i told you something interesting is there a set of things you're willing to change and a set of other things you're not willing to change yeah the set of things you're willing to do something about is much smaller than the number of things i can predict yeah mm. I guarantee you i can predict all sorts of things that you won't do anything about or that you can't do anything about or it's too complicated to do anything about right yeah um it's not legal it's not appropriate your investors won't like it. There's too many people. The union rules don't allow it. You know, the, the, the contracts don't allow it. Customer contracts don't allow it. The product design doesn't allow it. Whatever it is, right? I, there's all this stuff. It's just like, well, if you're not asking me in the context of that reality, then you're wasting everybody's time. Yeah. No? Yeah. What an interesting and, for me, unexpected answer to the intersection of AI, ML, and decision management. <laughs> As a prerequisite, you're destined to fail on your AI and ML pursuits if you aren't doing it in the context of business rules. Yeah, and I mean, that, that's, you, that's, that's my experience, yeah, for sure. When you put it like yeah. that, it, it makes so much sense. Uh, if you don't, then you're just creating arbitrary, actionless insights without yeah. context off of a big chunk of data. Yeah, right. And, and yeah, you can you can make yourself look very smart, right? I mean, did you ever follow um, the Mayflower autonomous ship? Oh, sure. Um, yeah. So it was a great example, right? Because it was full of, of really sophisticated AI for all sorts of vision and waves and all sorts of stuff, right? But running in the middle of it was ODM, IBM's business rules management system, because it turns out there's a whole set of rules, right? First of all, there's a set of regulations called the collision regulations, which define what ships are supposed to do when they meet other ships. And obviously your autonomous ship has to behave like a ship, right? It can't just like behave like randomly. And secondly, it turns out that there's a whole set of things that while the regulations say X in reality, Y happens. The example being technically, I think big ships are meant to give way to little ships. But when the big ship is a super tanker, by and large, it ignores this because it's really hard to turn, right? And so there's like a crew of Makes three sense. or whatever it is, and they just ignore it. They just assume you'll get out of the way, right? And so you also needed expertise, right? And so uh, one of the IBM team is a, is a, yacht, a yachtsman, and, and he worked through and they embodied all the regs and the best practices for yachting and everything else into a decision model that was implemented in, in uh, ODM and used that to say, okay, given what all the sensors are telling us, that's probably a rock. That's probably a ship. That's probably a wave. What do we do? What do we do so about what? it? So <laughs> what? Well, we don't go towards the rock. We don't go towards the ship. You know, uh, but there isn't enough room between the ship and the rock. Uh, and so we have to go to the right of the ship because that's what the coral regs say we have to do or whatever it is, right? You know, well, if you don't do that kind of stuff, then what would be the point, right? You know, you know just be a, a science experiment, right? You've yeah, successfully I identified a rock. Congratulations. Yeah, exactly. Your ship just exactly. crashed. <laughs> and, and, I, and, I, and I don't underestimate how hard some of those things are. Right? Sure, I sure. Mean, it's like, yeah. I mean, I remember giving a, an interview for someone and they were like, um, I was talking about AI failures, right? And how many there are. And they said, well, how would you describe an obvious AI success? And I said, well, name one. And she said, well, what about this recent one where um, AI is detecting cancer in scans that um, 
professionals are not spotting. And I said, I, would def- I wouldn't define that as a success. And she said, how can you not say it's a success? It's this fabulous research. And I'm like, yeah, no one is pointing out to a single patient whose treatment has been improved because of that prediction. When they yeah, have, that's what matters. then and only then will it be a successful AI project. It's a fascinating AI project, don't get me wrong. And as a research group, that's a great thing for them to do. But if I'm a hospital, what matters is when Jimmy comes in and has treatable cancer, do I find it sooner and, app- and appropriately treat it? Because if I find ca- treat cancers I wouldn't treat sooner, that doesn't help me. It's only helpful if I find cancers that I can and will treat earlier, right? Because if I find like prostate cancer that doesn't need treatment, finding it earlier doesn't help me because I'm not going to treat it, right? Because, you know. So, you know, that decision-making context matters. And, and, and uh, all this talk of AI and machine learning without this context drives me slightly insane because it's just like, who, who really, who that cares? Yeah, I mean, yeah. the research people do, but if you're a big business, and our customers like, like yours are generally, as we lovingly call them, big, boring companies, right? They're great big companies with lots of stuff going on, right? And they're not in the business of paying for research. They should yeah. be paying for machine learning research. They should be saying, here are, here are our top 10 operational problems where even small improvements would rank as real money. Help us make those decisions that drive that stuff a little bit more accurately, a little bit more precisely, a little bit more cost effectively, because, you know, we do that 10,000 times a minute. So yeah. if you can make it a tenth of a cent more <laughs> more effective, it's a hundred bucks a minute. Yeah, you know, that kind of stuff. You know? Love that. Hey, James, we are actually starting to come up on it. Um, I have a couple of rapid fire questions sure. for you, if I may. Um, this has been fascinating. We could talk about the AI ML intersection on business rules forever. Um, but I'm curious, what's the most common use case that your team runs into? And then Uh, what's your favorite use case if they're different? (laughs) Okay. So I would say the most common one we come into is probably still claims, but Hmm. origination specialty origination runs at a close second. There's a lot more use cases for decision management in banking than in most industries, um, but they have a lot more packages. So because we're a consulting firm, we tend not to see them quite as often, right? If you're doing credit card origination, you don't hire a consultant, you right. can buy a package. Right. So those would be probably the two. In terms of favorite ones, I actually like the ones that are oddball. I, I, I like the ones that are really unusual. How do we value a building? Okay, that's an interesting one, right? Um, you know, uh, mm. uh, how, do we, how do we help uh, uh, an independent agent make their, you know, make their day more effective? The, the most broad-based one is probably next best action or next best offer. Because you can do that anywhere. Almost any company can, that has customers, partners, suppliers can say, okay, sure. yeah, how do I make this a slightly better customer? And that's probably mm-hmm. the most, yeah. yeah. If you had to, when we talk to like people who are like, how do I find a good example? Well, yeah, does this matter? Because that's, that's typically across every industry. That's pretty easy, right? Yeah, yeah those are great. Uh, I, I thought you might have said either the loan origination or the claims review yeah, uh, right. you want claims review on the most common yeah, um, and then origination is pretty close i mean we do a lot but it tends to be specialty lines like auto loans or you know other kinds of lines because the the core origination is 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 uh, a little bit more packaged mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yeah and as you want to grow the sophistication of your rules yeah. on your core package that's where your, your team yeah then you get into trouble exactly yeah yeah, yeah. Um, okay. And what would you like the audience to take away from, from this fascinating discussion? Think about folks who are not there yet. Think about folks who are listening to it. Maybe they have somewhere between the hard coded rules Mm -hmm. in their homegrown application, or they're doing it manually. Maybe speak to those folks. If there's one message, one takeaway for them, what would you like for that to be? Um, that, that, the 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 cost benefit analysis for thinking about decisions is a lot better than you think it is it is much easier to work with someone like us and define what decision making you want and then automate it than you think it is and the value of this is much higher than you think it is 
Um, there's a tendency for people to be resistant to think, oh, I've got all these rules and it's so hard and it took me so long last time I tried to do a rules project. And we're like, the world has changed. You know, the way you think about the problem, the way you model the problem, the way you implement the problem, we can get this stuff done much faster, and much cheaper than you think we can. And the value you'll get out of it is much higher than you think. Right? And so you know, people have, you know, re have resisted automating decision-making and it's a pity. So mm -hmm. stop resisting automating decision-making and like think about decisions as something you absolutely can and should be automating as a first-class object right now. You know, don't wait. I think that's a great point to call it on. Thank you <laughs> so much, go. James. That was a great mic drop moment. Uh, best of luck to you and your team for the rest of the, the year and beyond. We, uh, we're looking forward to extending and, and continuing our partnership. We've got some, some fun things coming up for the rest of the summer. Yeah, and, we're looking uh, forward to it. Thank you again for the time. Well, thank you for having me. Thanks for listening to another episode of Bots and Thoughts, the hyper automation podcast sponsored by Salient Process. Be sure to never miss an episode by hitting that subscribe button wherever you're listening to this. Don't forget to connect and interact with us. You can find us on Bots and Thoughts' own LinkedIn page. And we're constantly running feedback surveys and ask that if you've made it this far in the episode, show us some love by responding to a survey and following us on LinkedIn. Finally, if you or someone you know would like to be a special guest on the show, we have a nomination form also down in the description for you to fill out. And with that, see you next episode and happy automating.